episode of Scholars and Shakes. We're here with Dr. Kate Haffey, Emily Kayser, and Elizabeth Vinto, and we have our um, coffee, acai bowl, and smoothie, and we're ready to so hit all the, you know, every part. Yeah. yeah. Love it. Love it. Great time. <laughs> all right, should we dive right in? I, we should dive right in. Okay, so just to start with you and your background in your education, so you do have a Bachelor of Science from Ohio University, mm -hmm. Master of Arts from Marquette University, and then a doctoral degree from the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee. So you've been through all of them, which is so fantastic, and you specialize in modern British fiction, contemporary British fiction, queer theory, methods of advanced literature studies, and you also teach senior seminars on Virginia Woolf in Bloom's Bloomsbury groups, am I saying that right? Mm -hmm. So, lots of things to talk about. Um, so that's just kind of who you are. Did you want to start with any questions? Um, so we have a few questions that we've prepared. And one that's interesting is, can you describe your research in three words? Three words. Um, well, the research that I'm currently working on, um, I would describe, uh, the three words would be queer, friendship, and can I have a compound word with yeah, hyphens? We'll, we'll allow. Uh, we'll allow. <laughs> 20th century British literature. I like it. Yes. Yeah. So what like made you, like, why the 20th century? Just because it's like obviously very specific. Um, well, when, when you're in grad school, you kind of, you basically get uh, a period and a uh, area of the world, um, uh, literature written in English, and generally it's either British or American. Mm -hmm. And really for most of my studies, I focused on both. Um, I did like what was called transatlantic and thought about kind of the connections across the world because in the 20th century, um, there isn't the same sort of divide between different parts of the world because of you know globalization and people were reading each other. Um, but I, I ended up uh, working on um, 20th century British literature probably because I'm obsessed with Virginia Woolf and if uh, you know uh, a lot of my earlier research was on Virginia Woolf and so when I was looking for jobs I was much more qualified for the jobs that had to do with uh, the 20th century British literature because in most universities they divide it like oh you do early American literature or contemporary American literature and then in, in uh, with the English literature it's like very much like every hundred years and so uh, I've done more than that, but that's just kind of how departments are organized. Um, but yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. I like, obviously have not been through a master's program, so I was just interested in how that worked. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of your dissertation, so that was um, in the intersection between sexu sexuality and time in the 20th century literature. Could you just elaborate a little bit on that? Yes. Um, actually, that is the um, book that I have currently just finished. I'm in the very final process of. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I uh, actually hand in, have to hand in my proofs on Thursday. I'm wow. just copy editing, so everything else is done. But um, <laughs> that project started as my dissertation, and um, basically, in the last I'd say 20 years, uh, people who have been studying, uh, you know, sexuality have have noticed that. Um, the way that we organize our life narratives is very often through these like stages that we go through where it's like, okay, as a young child, you imagine yourself, um, you know, going to school, going through adolescence, and then there's this kind of idea that your life will take a certain path. And historically, that's often been like, oh, courtship, heterosexual marriage, reproduction, and it's been very kind of focused on, uh, the, you know, uh, being part of like the nuclear, nuclear family. And so for people who do not identify as straight or people who do not want to couple, they kind of are outside of that temporal framework. It, you know, um, very often, especially until, you know, the last five or so years, marriage wasn't legal for um, LGBT uh, individuals. And so there were lots of kind of life narratives that were um, outside of the norm and, and as such, uh, how people imagine kind of moving through a life was very different and this you know kind of had effects on um, the way that time was represented in um, literature and so I looked at the ways in which that came together in some of the you know most prominent 20th century um, novelists like Virginia Woolf or um, T.S. Eliot, who uh, writes poetry, but also is very interested in time. People don't really think about him in terms of how what that means for sexuality, but he was very interested in time, and I looked at how um, his what he says about time could be related to these issues. 
also in people like William Faulkner, mm -hmm. um, who uh, William Faulkner very much a lot of his his work on time has to do with um, how uh, family narratives are kind of like the genealogy where fathers are kind of responding to their, or, sorry, sons are responding to their father's histories. And so it's very much about kind of parents and children. And what does it mean to kind of think outside of that really um, kind of normative idea of genealogy that is passed from fathers to sons to children, especially around kind of individuals who um, are outside of those family narratives often because they've kind of been rejected from families based mm -hmm. on their sexuality. Mm -hmm. So um, those are some of the things that I look at in, in that book. Um, and uh, yeah, and I've been working on that for so long that it just feels like uh, it's taken up my life for the last, you know, 10 years or wow. so. Wow, wow. Commitment, man. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> I think school is the only thing I've done consecutively for 10 years. Um, Me too. Yeah. 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 But like, you're almost done. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I just never left school, right? Yeah, so, like, like I went straight. Yeah. You know, I mean, I know I'm not in school, but I've never been off of a university. I've never been outside of the academic calendar. Like, I don't know what life is like when, <laughs> without a semester ending. Yeah. No right. Idea, yeah. Right? Yeah. So, I in that sense, I'm probably like you all because you've been in yeah, school like your whole life, life, right? Yeah. Exactly. Just imagine, just add like 15 years onto this, and then you. you Ooh. You. <laughs> 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 I saw something on Facebook that was like, when you realize that the only thing that you've done successfully for a long period of time is school, or the, the only thing that you've done right in life is sleep. It's like, ugh. okay, relatable. So, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are my two talents, also, school and sleep. Yep. Best thing. I'm really good. Yeah. What led you to want to come to UMW? A job. <laughs> Always a perk. You're right. Yes. <laughs> No, I mean, I will say, so, I mean, it's really hard to get a job in academia, especially, I mean, I can't speak for other disciplines, I just know it's really hard in, in literature. Like, in any given year, you know, there's only 20 or 30 jobs in the whole country that, that like, fit each person's, um, you know, period and area. So it's like, I was applying for jobs for 20th century British literature, and there were only 20 jobs that year, and there are, like, you know, three, depending on where, there are hundreds of people applying to that. Um, but I remember when the job ad came out for Mary Washington, um, I read about it and I was like, that's the kind of place I want to be at. I, I was actually a visiting professor at Gettysburg, which is a small liberal arts school, um, but it's private. And I like the small liberal arts feel. I really want to have relationships with my students where I can mentor them. Um, I went to a big school and I barely knew my professors at all. And I've luckily been teaching at smaller schools while I've had the ability to get to know students. And so when I saw Mary Washington, for me it was the perfect mix because it was a state school. So it meant that it was a type of school that more people could afford to go to. Um, you know, whereas Gettysburg was like more than $60,000 a year. So it meant that I was teaching a very specific group of students that could afford to do that. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I wanted to be at a place that was more accessible than that, but still had the small classes and still, you know, allowed me to have the sort of interactions that you get at one of those types of schools. And, you know, and then when I um, was brought in for my campus uh, interviews, I just, you know, it, it really solidified that this was a great place to be, especially since I saw my colleagues and how they talked about their students and how they got to like actually have relationships with their students and I was like okay this is you know I was uh, you know once I saw that it was you know at the top of my list I really this was the job that I wanted that year um, and luckily it worked out so yeah. how long have you been at Mary Washington uh, this is uh, the end of my fifth year so awesome. mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to say that was something that definitely drew me to Mary Washington too, because I didn't want to. I have family members who went to you know schools with forty six thousand people, and you know I didn't want to just be a number in a lecture hall. Right. I wanted to actually know my professors and be right. able to ask them questions and know them and not be able to mm -hmm. or not be afraid to show up at office hours and be like, I know you don't know me, but you know. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty sure that was my essay topic to get into Mary Washington. I'm not just another number. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that was my topic. Yeah. Um. I mean, I love, like, when I write letters of recommendations for students, I can say really specific things. You know, mm -hmm. I just wrote one for a student who um, actually ended up getting, like, a full 
um, uh, ride for both for a master's and for a PhD. So she was choosing between them. And I had had so many classes with her and, and she had done research with me that I was able to like really like fill out this, you know, really robust statement about her. And I just know that none of my professors could have ever said that about me because I was not... I was not able to be that close to them because I was a number. It was like terrifying to ask someone for a letter because I'm like, yeah, I did well in your class, but do you even remember me? Right. You know? Do you know my name? Yeah. Like right. if I walked into your office, would you be like, hey, yeah. number 62? Right, or, yeah. exactly. Um, do you have a particular like favorite class you like to teach at Mary Washington? Oh, there's I a know, lot that I really like to teach. <laughs> I mean, I, I can narrow it down to a few. I really like teaching queer literature because it's a 200 level class and people take it for such varying reasons. I mean, it's a, it's a 200 level class, which means that it's not just English majors. And I think it like serves a really important need for a lot of people who've never, if they, if they identify as LGBT, have never seen themselves represented in stuff that was, you know, uh, coming into the classroom. Maybe that's less so uh, now, but it's certainly for a lot of people, school systems are not even going to teach that because they're afraid of like, with, with like, for example, with Fun Home, right? The controversy right. around that. A lot of uh, schools have kind of gotten into trouble for making that the common right. read. Um, so I really like teaching that class and it, and there, it also, we f tend to form a really good rapport in that class and have a lot of fun with it. Yeah. Um, I also really like to teach uh, our methods class, English 295, because you introduce students to all these different types of theory that is applicable to literature, but across like any, you know, sort of um, object of analysis. So they, they read about, you know, feminist theory and Marxist theory and deconstructionism and all those ideas um, can be used and can be applied, you know, in, in a vast uh, variety of situations. I'm, I'm betting that even, you know, that in communication, you, you use some of those same approaches, but with different, um, you know, focuses. Um, and then I also really like teaching senior seminars because it's the place where you can really talk about the stuff that you've done the most research on. So you can really speak to your students and because they're far enough along that you can speak to them as a scholar who you yourself are trying to figure things out and they can see you negotiate um, those sorts of processes that they are doing in their papers as well, right? So that yeah. you can kind of talk about the trouble with writing and how hard writing is, how, yeah. how hard it is to begin writing, yeah. and what it means to kind of like have this love-hate relationship with it. Yeah. Um, and that's the sort of thing that you can do with advanced students that you probably can't do when students are first and second mm -hmm. years. And it's in a smaller group too. I'm right. Yeah. Small yeah. yeah. Like ours is yeah. like 12, 15 people. Oh, yeah. So that's our class. You should know everyone real quick. And um, but they're <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, in our seminar class, um, something that Dr. Johnson Young has said is that, you know, this is kind of the time where we get to really um, bring everything together that we've done so mm -hmm. far and like put it into one, you know, mm -hmm. like one into one final hurrah. Right. Like, it's like the culminating experience hurrah. of your, your education, right? Yeah. It's, it's in your major, it's... It's, uh, you know, where it all comes together. Yeah, yeah. which is kind of cool because it's mm -hmm. like I haven't taken the time to think about like, this is what I've taken, this is what I've written, this is what I've done, you know, mm -hmm. and just combining all those concepts. Yeah. yeah. And so with the, um, you know, kind of the, the harshness towards humanities right now, um, and we do hear from potential students at UMW and their parents, why would you major in English? What's the utility sort of of the humanities in English? Um, what would you say to that? Oh man, I have, so, I have so many answers. Okay, so like, yeah. okay, let's just think about all of the different things that you can use English or humanities degree for. Like right now, I don't know if you've been following this, but like, um, in terms of medical school, right, they're looking for um, medical applicants who are not biology majors. They actually are just like take, you know, major in something else and get these other skills and get yeah. the uh, the classes that you need. I um, my sister in law is a doctor who is an English major. Um, in terms of MCATs, people who uh, have humanities degrees tend to do some of the best on MCATs. I mean, uh, being a lawyer is all about language. It's all about reading the law, analyzing the law, and making arguments based on that. Mm -hmm. And that's what a humanities degree turns you, tells you to be. So doctor, lawyer, we think of these as like really high prestige jobs, but there's also, you know, um, a whole variety of ways to do this. My, my brother works for nonprofits, and he said that, you know, he's always looking for people in uh, those uh, in humanities fields because they're trained to be problem solvers, right? So like, you know, uh, 
so many of the jobs that we have right now might not exist in the future. When you get into a job, they train you for that job, but what you really need are these overarching applicable skills. Mm -hmm. And I think that, so you, if you go for a very specific type of degree, like the technology moves past that, right? right? Like very quickly. And some of those jobs are gonna be automated. So the ability to think, problem solve, to write, to communicate, to deal with language is, you know, at the core of so many different jobs. I also, um, my brother's best friend works at like, um, he does like some sorts of development. He says, you know, he has people that do, do uh, uh, what he's always looking for are people to produce content. Right. And content is like, you know, the ability to do that comes out of humanities, communication, you know, all of these sorts of things. So I really think that you know, it, it sets you up from all different types of right. careers. I think it's one of the most versatile things that you can do because there's skills that have, that they're applicable across mm -hmm. a lot of different, um, right. um, you know, disciplines. Mm -hmm. well, I think this has been awesome and I think it's so important to think about what other people study. And yes. And, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And the important ways that you critique, uh, you know, the, the, the works that you look at. Um, mm -hmm. I'm excited about your book. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'm excited. What is the title of the book? Um, title. <laughs> well, so they made me switch it because the because it's easier to search this way. But it's um, literary modernism, queer temporality, eddies in time. Okay. So eddies like eddies in a river. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's, but it used to be eddies in time because usually it's like the evocative thing was yeah. often first. But now they want the like. Um, descriptive thing first, so it's easier yeah, to search. Yeah. Right, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. exactly. So, okay. so I had to switch it. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it should it'll it should be out June actually. Yeah.